Welcome to America's Web Radio. This is Ron Bachman, and you're listening to Healthcare Insight. And as usual, we are not going to be talking about healthcare per se, as you might think of it in terms of free market options, replacement of Obamacare. What we've been talking about the last number of months is the health of America, the health of our domestic policy, the health of our foreign policy, the relationships uh, that are going on around the world in terms of our military, in terms of the production of goods, in terms of inflation, in terms of our border, all those different issues uh, I've been trying to focus on because those are the most important things. We're not about to get to talking about free market health insurance anytime soon. So we need to fix these other problems and it might be until 2024 before we can really get back into the issues of how do we take care of our elderly, of our families, of our children with a real health care reform that gives us choices and options. So I want to take this hour and talk to a number of congressional experts, um, political experts, economists. I want to have an exposure of things that are going on, of things that have been said in parts of the media that most people don't see or hear, whether that's on C-SPAN, whether that's on a business channel during the day when most people don't see it. And many of these things are not reported on national news at all, but they are working underneath to set the tone for our economy, for our lives, for our children, their education, their ability to go back to school, the types of things that are going on with um, this government turning towards a heavy hand towards people, towards a socialist, even Marxist approach to dealing with the citizenry of this country. So I want to start by an interview with one of my favorite congressmen, Congressman Jim Jordan from Ohio. He's usually very clear and very animated, but right on point for what's going on. He's a, he's a ranking member on the judiciary, and he's involved in most of the aspects of the Republican leadership in setting the tone uh, in Washington. So I want to ask him about the recent activities of government stepping into our children's education. We've seen some of this on national news of parents getting upset at school boards in the Loudoun County, Virginia has gotten a lot of press the um, head of the Justice Department, our Attorney General, uh, Merritt Garland, is stepping in and talking about people uh, who are protesting that they don't want critical race theory, they don't want the type of sex education and exposure to young children in schools, and he's been calling them terrorists. So I want to hear from Jim Jordan and some of his comments. And then I'll try to comment after um, we hear from each of these uh, folks that I've picked up uh, bits and pieces that you can also find on YouTube, but it all gets kind of buried in. And I think it's really important for this audience to listen carefully to what's happening in this country. You can feel it. You know something is going wrong, but you don't always have the time to hear the arguments or hear the exposure of the people that are being put in charge, the new nominees that are uh, setting a tone for this country, that are going to be in judicial appointments for years, if not a lifetime. So let me turn this over now to Jim Jordan and his comments about what's going on with the school board and the government clamping down on people, taking away their rights and privileges. Congressman Jordan, give us some of your thoughts on the craziness that's going on in some of these areas. Well, uh, Mayor Garland will be in front of our committee in two weeks, so I'm looking forward to asking him questions about this issue and a host of others, the FISA court, you know, all kinds of things I think we need to ask uh, the attorney general about. First time he's been in front of the committee, you know, since he's been attorney general this, this entire Congress. So we're looking forward to that. But I guess my first takeaway is, you know, Democrats tell us Antifa is not a terrorist organization. But parents are. Mm. I mean, th this is what offends so many people. And, you know, we had this is on the heels of what happened last week where Secretary of Education Cardona said, oh, parents are just upset because their guy, President Trump, their guy didn't win. 
I mean, the, the disdain they have for moms and dads who care infinitely more about the well-being of their children than some bureaucrat in Washington, D.C. does, uh, it just, just drives people crazy. So, um, look, I'm looking forward to asking Mr. Garland some questions about this and a host of other issues, but this is as wrong as it gets. Well, Congressman Jordan, it doesn't take a, um, a Harvard Law School degree to understand that this is just freedom of speech, a right to redress your government and your elected officials. And yet we've got an attorney general that says this is uh, equivalent to terrorism. This is domestic terrorism. You know, back when Obamacare was uh, being uh, discussed before it was passed, people were being called unpatriotic if you didn't listen to them. Then they were called racist. And I guess that's not enough. So now we got to call people as being domestic terrorists to threaten them, to shut their voices down, to get them afraid they're going to be targeted by the IRS, to be targeted by the um, FBI. Uh, and so this is just a way to shut down people. So don't we just have the right to speak anymore? What this is, is this is an attack on the First Amendment. You have a right to redress your grievances, to go to the government, to redress your grievances, to, to petition your government, to hear your concerns. That's what parents are doing. And some of these parents, are, you know, right outside of D.C. and Loudoun County, it's a big issue with this, with the critical race theory. There's going to be some moms run for school board who are going to win, who are going to replace these very people who were calling, you know, saying parents are, are domestic terrorists. This is going to change, and it is a good thing. And some of those same moms... You know, I always say I have to deal with lobbyists all the time, but no high paid lobbyist will ever beat a mom on a mission, a mission to do what's best for her child. And these moms, some of them are going to win these school board races. They're going to transform their school. And then in a few years, those same people are going to be running for the United States Congress. And that's a good thing. We have to push back at every level. You know, Congressman, this audience has shown a real concern with these uh presentations, radio program, podcasts that have been put on about this dramatic change in our government that's going on that some people are more aware of than others, but it's like a cancer eating away at our freedoms. How do you feel about what's going on from your perch there in Washington, D.C.? Do you see this as the same kind of march towards socialism, Marxism, that many of us are feeling out here in the hinterlands? This march towards communism and socialism from today's left is crazy. They want to think about this. The federal government wants to control your health. They want to control your bank account. We found out about that proposal. And now they want to control your child's education. And it is scary. So, Congressman, let's talk about that Loudoun County and the whole state of Virginia. You've got um, Terry McAuliffe that is running for governor again in the state of Virginia. He was governor a number of years back. And I guess it was at a uh, debate with the Republican that he said parents really have no right to tell school boards what to teach their children. Um, I guess it's the state's responsibility. So, you know, what in the world is going on with our government leaders that seem to want to dominate every aspect of our lives, including telling us we don't have a right on how our children should be educated? I guess he thinks it's going to help his cause, but do you think that kind of statement about parents being unable to interact with school boards to get the children taught the way they should be taught and not have some of this critical race theory uh, taught to their children, forced on their children, do you think that really helps them? No, it's going to hurt. I mean, that was the same week as Cardona made his comments, and then we have now what the attorney general is doing. It, it's not going to work, but it's, again— it's this disdain that the so-called elite have for us regular folks. Remember Peter Strzok? Remember Peter Strzok when he said he's in the Walmart and he said, I can smell the Trump supporters. They don't like us. We're the deplorables. We're the ones who cling to our Bible and guns. But, but and the, truth, the truth is we're just regular Americans who value the Constitution, who value liberty and care about our kids' education and don't want this racist you know, uh, bash America curriculum called critical race theory. We don't want that taught to our kids. Well, Congressman, I guess the liberals out there, the socialists think that critical race theory kind of teaching is going to help somebody. 
But don't we already know that these types of things never help the people that it's supposed to help? And in fact, it's going to hurt the minorities. They're going to think that they are always the victim. They can't get ahead. There's no uh, American dream for them to pursue because the person sitting right next to them uh, who's white, who has not been involved with any of the political structure or financial structure, but just by the nature of their birth, they are oppressors. So children shouldn't get along because one's oppressed and one's the oppressor. Isn't this the worst possible way to divide people and to hold down expectations? Isn't this the racism of low expectations for the minority community? What's your thoughts? Also, what really bothers me is if you could think back to the people who impacted your life, it was a teacher or coach who you had when you were when you're coming through your education. And it was always the ones who challenged you, who demanded mm. you work hard, who told you about setting goals, working hard and accomplishing things. That's not what this curriculum is about. This curriculum is about, oh, you're a victim. Everyone's a victim. How is that helping that individual and how is that helping right. our country? So I think about my old coach and my chemistry teacher and the things he taught me. He challenged our, me and my classmates every and teammates every single day. Those are the people I remember and respect. That's not what this is about. And that's, that's again, what's so unfortunate and why this is so wrong. Well, Congressman, what people in this audience even may not fully understand is how these crazy policies and issues that we're seeing in, in, with school boards is translating over into the federal budget where these new proposals by the Biden administration are looking to hand out billions, trillions of dollars in new welfare programs and child care and pre-K and free college, but there's no work requirements for some of these new welfare programs. There's no educational requirements. I mean, this is madness. It's another way of just sort of keeping the minorities, for the most part, down on the plantation. Isn't that what's really going on? No, you're, you're, you're exactly right. All the, all the big spending uh, coupled with we're going to run your health, we're going to run your child's education, we're going to run your bank account, you don't have to work. And what does Dr. Fauci also say last week? He says, oh, you have to give up your freedom for the greater good. Now, if that's not communism, if that's not socialism, I don't know what is. That is not healthy for individuals. That's not healthy for families. And it's certainly not good for our country. But that is exactly where the left wants to take us. And this is all kind of playing out in these school board fights that are happening around the country because parents don't buy it. They don't want that. They don't want that kind of curriculum, that kind of education for their kids. They actually believe in what you and I believe in, setting goals, working hard, and achieving the American dream. That's what we should be encouraging and teaching the young people in our school. Well, Congressman Jim Jordan, I want to thank you for being very clear, being very concise and explaining what's going on in this country. And I just hope that you can stay in Washington and fight the good fight to keep this kind of crazy, whether you want to call it liberalism, progressivism, socialism, Marxism, communism, it's all kind of in the same mode as we move further and further to the left. And I hope people in this audience are listening to your words and the warnings about what's going on and speak up at their own local uh, community uh, to your own, their own local community officials, to their school boards, to their representatives, to anybody who will listen to stop this madness that's going on in this country. Let's take a break, and we'll be right back with more words of wisdom from elected officials. Welcome back to America's Web Radio. This is Ron Bachman, and we are talking with um, Representative Jim Jordan. He's a very smart guy. He's there in Washington. He knows the problems and the issues, the good, the bad, and the ugly of what's going on in Washington. And I want to continue, at least for this next segment, this presentation by uh, Representative Jordan talking about the current issues that are going on that everybody listening to this program needs to hear closely, pay attention. This is what's happening to our country. And this is what the Republicans in Congress are fighting for every day to stop some of the craziness that's going on in this administration and in the Democratic Party. So I want to turn back to Representative Jordan, and I think he has recently been down to the border. So um, Congressman Jordan, tell us what you have seen or what your observations are about the border problem 
down uh, in Texas. Southern border has been open every single month. I mean, just it's like we're letting them in. It's almost like it's a deliberate, intentional policy they've adopted month after month after month, up over 200,000 illegal encounters in the month of July and August, each of those two months. So, Congressman, you've personally seen the open borders policy, the neglect of this Biden administration. So we got open borders, but now we also have, it seems, closed ports. What have you seen in California and the port situation is going on over there where we can't get ships in to deliver goods across the United States. So uh, you have that going on. Meanwhile, I was just in California this past week. I saw the ships. I saw them and they're in the Los Angeles area. You, you saw them just anchored offshore. And as I talked to some of the folks there, they said they've been there for months. So um, when well, you pay people not to work, you shouldn't be surprised when you don't have workers. And then when you add on top of that, the crazy policies in the state of California, you get this situation where we have rising prices. And as you said, empty shelves. Uh, this is what happens when you have people in the Biden administration who have gotten everything wrong. Well, Congressman, this is all about transportation, both into this country and then extending that transportation across the United States so that goods can be delivered. And we have such a shortage of drivers for trucks. We've got people being paid to stay home and they're not going back to work as rapidly as some people, I guess, anticipated. But the Secretary of Transportation is Pete Buttigieg. Is it really time maybe that that guy ought to be under more pressure to resign, to fire him, because it's destroying our economy. You can't get, as they're telling us now, we won't be able to get Christmas presents because we can't get it delivered. You got uh, companies like Costco getting their own containers, their own ships to ship stuff over here to bypass the increasing costs of shipping because these containers now have gone up, I understand, over 300% in cost. So companies that want to get goods to their consumers are going to try to find ways by this. So is it time to get rid of Buttigieg? Well, I, I don't know that he's been there, right? So, I mean, I, I, if, if he'd have been there, it would have been a different. Who knows? Um, what we do know is this administration, every single policy area is now worse than it was under President Trump. We had things moving in the right direction in a big way under President Trump. These guys have messed up everything. But again, it's driven by their crazy policies. I and mean, when you have the president of the United States uh, begging OPEC to increase oil production, particularly when just a few months ago we were energy independent, that tells you how serious, how bad the situation is. Well, thank you, Congressman Jim Jordan, for your uh, valuable insights. I think this audience learned a lot from your very straightforward comments about what's going on in this crazy administration. I want to kind of change gears now, and I want to bring in somebody else who's a very thoughtful individual who Republicans, conservatives have looked up to for a long time, and that is uh, ex-speaker uh, Newt Gingrich. Now, Newt, with the craziness that's going on that we've described here so far in this podcast, in this radio program. Um, how are we going to get out of this? What are some of the real issues, um, the voting rights laws that uh, states have been passing to um, protect the ballot, to try to eliminate the opportunities for fraud that uh, has gone on? Um, many people say you can't, there is no fraud, but, but we know that States changed, uh, judges changed, uh, local officials changed, and the Constitution says that's up to the prerogative of the state legislature. So we know changes were made that made our ballots less safe, whether we can prove it or not after the fact when you have secret ballots and the ballot gets separated from the envelope that got sent in, it's impossible to trace. And anybody who tried to play games with the last election uh, knew that. And, and now, just because you can't find it, you can't identify things that are separated, um, we've, we've got um, an inability to really track down whatever fraud was there. But we certainly can prevent it knowing that uh, there's great possibilities that it actually occurred. But this administration, when you try to do things like being sure that the ballot is properly signed and that there's a verification that they're legitimate uh, citizens uh, eligible to vote, they call this the... Uh, the, uh, the greatest threat to democracy since the Civil War. Sounds like a little bit of an exaggeration. What is, what is your take on all this going on around ballot um, integrity laws that are going on across the country and the administration's response to it? Well, and you're certainly technically correct 
But of course, that's not what this is about. This isn't about facts. This is about a narrative. And, and I'm going to surprise you on two counts. First of all, I don't know how many people picked up on this, but we ought to start talking about Vice President Kinko Harris. Kinko's went out of business 13 years ago. I mean, this is a woman totally out of touch with reality. A lot of people worry about President Biden and his cognitive abilities. Well, you ought to watch her for a week. She literally cited Kinko's. Kinko's has not been in existence for 13 years. And I know that's a tricky thing if you're from California, but still, I think it tells you a lot about who they are. They don't know anything. They're not in touch with reality. They make it up as they go along. But I'm going to shock you. I agree with the president. This is the greatest threat to the survival of freedom since the Civil War. They are determined to use the power of the federal government. They're determined to destroy the American military by bringing wokeness in. They're determined to weaken the police while strengthening criminals. They're determined to use the Justice Department. They're determined to side with oligarchs in censoring Americans. I believe this is the greatest threat, domestic threat, not counting the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany, but the greatest domestic threat the United States has faced to freedom since the Civil War, and the threat is entirely in the Democratic Party, and it is a mortal threat, and if they get their way, if they can pass the Corrupt Politicians Act, you will see them steal everything they need to steal. Mr. Speaker, you're a smart guy. The polling shows that ballot integrity, the voices of people and elected officials, citizens voting, that's like uh, 80% in favor of this stuff, especially the signing of ballots, the voter ID. And yet the Democratic Party is against these things. How do we move forward? How do we recognize, how do we replace this mentality that doesn't even want to recognize the majority are in favor of ballot integrity? We want our ballot to be counted and somebody else who shouldn't be voting shouldn't be voting because they dilute the ballots of legitimate voters. People are out there harvesting ballots and having people sign away in nursing homes the, their ballots. They have, they have no clue. They may have Alzheimer's. They may have dementia. And yet people are out there collecting votes. They have drop-off areas. They have printed ballots that people just fill in. We know that's going on once it's in the system and because of the um, security of our voting processes, the fraud is lost. You can't prove it. So how does these 80-20 type measures that the citizenry is favoring, how does that not get implemented at some point um, in our government? How do the Democrats and the Biden administration ignore what the American people want? But, but here's the problem you've got. Freedom in Cuba is probably an 80-20 issue. That doesn't mean the Cuban government won't shoot enough people to slow it down. Freedom in Venezuela is probably a 90-10 issue. The fact is, these people, the Bidens, the Harrises, the Schumers, the Pelosi's, they're corrupting the military, they're corrupting the entire system, and they will do whatever they have to to try to dominate us and to dominate all of the American people and impose their radical values. This is the greatest threat to the United States since the Civil War. Well, Speaker Gingrich, let me change topics a little bit. Still talking about this administration and the ineptitude of it, um, but let's get your thinking about what happened in Afghanistan and the impact on foreign policy that that disaster um, has created and is likely to create. What is your observation on uh, the impact of the debacle in Afghanistan and your view as to why or how the administration uh, managed to let that happen. You know, the tragedy of all this is he's still going to be president for more than three more years. Nobody in the world is going to trust him. Uh, the Europeans are watching him abandon them. <clears throat> Remember, they have, there are, I think, 100,000 Europeans in Afghanistan. The Afghans who fought on our side are watching him abandon them. 
he has surrendered to the Taliban. The Chinese are openly saying this means that Taiwan will now be gone because nobody is going to trust uh, Biden to protect Taiwan. Uh, the damage he has done, and I don't know whether it's senility or ignorance or arrogance, but I do know that the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs should both resign. They, they accepted a plan that was militarily impossible. You cannot give up Bagram Airfield and think you're going to keep the embassy. This, this is insanity. Right. And you, you, the president gets elected by the American people, so if he wants to do something totally crazy, that's a problem for Congress to deal with. But we don't have to tolerate a secretary of defense and a chairman of the Joint Chiefs who accept and implement. They should both have threatened to resign. They accepted and implemented a plan which was militarily impossible. Surrender to the Taliban, keep the embassy, give up your only combat center in the country, and think it's going to work somehow? Uh, I'm, I'm appalled. I'm, I'm frankly more appalled by the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. I expected Biden to range between senility and arrogance in the way he operates, but you don't have to accept that out of your senior appointee. Well, Speaker Newt Gingrich, um, ex-speaker, former Speaker Newt Gingrich, um, you've had many roles in government. What most people probably don't fully know about is that until the Biden administration asked you to step aside, you have been the longest running teacher in the uh, War College, the American War College, training, teaching uh, generals and other military leaders uh, about history, about war techniques, uh, to the competition in the international market. You have been the leading voice out there of consistency, of uh, being sure that our people are well-trained at the very top levels of our military. Uh, Biden asked you to step aside and not do that anymore, which is a real shame. But thank you for your words of wisdom in this segment. And to the audience, we will be right back in a few minutes after this commercial break. Welcome back to America's Web Radio. We are talking about the health of the country, the health of our domestic policy, the health of our foreign policy. We're not talking about health care per se that we started this uh, podcast and program with because there's so many other issues that need to be addressed and the craziness that's going on with the Biden administration. So in this third segment uh, this week, I want to continue with Speaker uh, Newt Gingrich. And uh, Newt, I want to ask you about really the impact, again, on foreign policy, what's happening across the country, and especially what's going on globally uh, that are connected to our border crisis that many people may not even full, be fully aware of. So give us your observations from uh, the global perspective on what's happening with the Biden programs that include weakness and open borders and just telling everybody what they need to do, almost a totalitarian rule in many aspects. Well, look, I think you've got, with Biden, such a weak president. Uh, I'm very worried uh, that you're going to see the Chinese communists decide to occupy Taiwan. Uh, the number of airplanes that have flown over Taiwan from China in the last four days is just astounding. <clears throat> and it's a prelude, potentially, to them uh, taking over the island. And it's because Biden looks so unbelievably weak. Uh, I did a podcast recently with the Gallup uh, poll expert who's spent 40 years now in Central America. He describes uh, in the Biden world, uh, you now have people who fly from Haiti to Ecuador and then come up through Colombia to the United States by the tens of thousands. You have Africans flying into Brazil to come up to the United States by the thousands. And all of this is spreading and accelerating. Uh, you're presently going to have four or 500,000 people every single month. Uh, and <clears throat> no society can absorb and assimilate that scale of in-migration. Well, Newt, not only, as you point out, do we have these foreign policy and immigration crises that are self-created by the Biden administration. But internally, we've got this great conflict about how much socialism we're willing to accept. And many of us listening in on this broadcast have also seen 
news reports of Senator Manchin and Senator from Arizona uh, being attacked and being followed in the bathrooms or being um, uh, crowds gathering outside of their vacation or their homes to chant and and harass them. Um, how is this going to solve our problems if we can't have a logical, rational, adult debate around issues and recognize that people can have different views without demonizing them, without calling them racist, without calling them white supremacists, without attacking them uh, in the most personal way that's happening to um, these two senators who are not going along with the Biden's domestic spending of three and a half trillion, four, five, six trillion, and when you put it all together, probably as much as ten trillion dollars. What's your observation on these domestic attacks on certain senators? Uh, th these things are real crises, and of course, the totalitarian left, which is what you're watching in that bathroom and what you're watching around Senator Manchin, they're playing with fire. Uh, what you showed from Talladega, what you showed from the football stadiums, remember, there are a lot more of us than there are of these crazed radicals. And yeah. if we ever decide to respond in kind, they'll be gone. Well, Speaker, most of us on the conservative and Republican side have been worried with the current balance of favoring Democrats so strongly, controlling the House, uh, controlling the Senate with the vice president's uh, tie-breaking vote gives them total control of the Senate if the Democrats all stick together, and they always seem to do that. Um, the Republicans are holding on to a thin thread of rational, fiscally responsible approach with the votes of Senator Manchin from West Virginia and the vote from uh, Christine Sinema of Arizona. It's a very thin thread. They're both Democrats, and it may just be a matter of time before they go with the Democrats. How much money are Democrats and these expensive trillion-dollar bills going to throw at Arizona and West Virginia uh, to buy the votes? So it'll be like the 19 uh, or 2010 vote for the Obamacare. You had the Louisiana Purchase and the uh, Nebraska Cornhusker deal and all sorts of money being thrown around to buy votes of representatives that the administration needed to pass Obamacare. What's going to prevent us um, from that happening again? Now, Joe Manchin comes from a state where the governor uh, has changed from being a Democrat to a Republican. Um, we've seen that all across the country over the last couple of decades of the Democratic Party has gotten so extreme, uh, they leave. So What's your take on Joe Manchin? What kind of game is he playing and how serious do you think he really is in holding the line of the Democrats to keep them from packing the court, from adding new states to get more Democratic uh, governors, from getting rid of the filibuster, from outspending uh, any other administration that's ever existed? What's your take on these two senators? Well, I, I look, I think <clears throat> I can't quite figure out what Manchin's doing. Because on the one hand, Manchin says the bill has to include the Hyde Amendment, which says you cannot use taxpayer money to pay for abortion. There's nobody on the left who's going to accept that. Nobody. So I don't know if he's setting up an excuse to kill the bill or if that's just a maneuver to negotiate. In the case of Cinema, she's shown very tough, very calm, uh, very much just being her own person. And frankly, they can't pressure her very much. I mean, she's been elected in a state which, which elects Mavericks. It elect Barry Goldwater. It elected John McCain. She's perfectly in that kind of a tradition. But the big government socialists are desperate. And that's what you're seeing is a desperation, which I think the rest of the country is beginning to react to. And that's why you're getting these chants in football stadiums and at Talladega. The, the average American is fed up with being browbeaten by a bunch of crazy left-wing radicals. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As usual, you give great insights and information that many people have not heard and need to hear because it's very important. Now, for our audience, I want to change gears a little bit and go back to one of my favorite senators, Senator John Kennedy, and his unique way of diving right into the critical issues. So I want to play 
various segments then comment on uh, a hearing that was held in the Senate with Energy Senate uh, Energy Secretary uh, Jennifer uh, Granholm, and he gets right to the point of the craziness of the Biden administration energy policy. So please um, listen to this and we'll stop and start it and make some comments along the way. But it's very important for our audience to listen to this and see how our energy policy has been so distorted with wokeness that we've gone from energy independence, the greatest producer in the world of energy, selling it around the world to help fund our own government, to now we're energy dependent on the rest of the world. So here's the first question from Senator John Kennedy. How much money in public and private dollars does the department think it would make, it would take to make the world carbon neutral? I don't have a number for that, but probably a lot. Yeah. Hundreds of trillions of dollars, you think? It would be a lot, for okay. sure. How much money uh, in public and private doctors do dollars does the uh, department think it would take to make the United States carbon neutral. Again, it would be a lot. Hundreds of trillions? I, I don't know about hundreds of trillions, but it would be a lot of money. For It'd sure. be on the trillions? Yes. Mid-trillions? I, I don't know. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> Notice that the Secretary of Energy laughs at the most important question that she should know an answer to. And yet she dismisses the question as if it's a ridiculous question to even ask with a laugh when she doesn't know the answer to how much it's going to take to make this country or certainly the world carbon neutral. So let's go back and listen to this interchange that should have the most fundamental questions that Senator Kennedy is asking and there should be fundamental answers provided by our Secretary of Treasury, but you'll notice there is none. So let's go back to this exchange between those two parties. To make the United States carbon neutral based on the administration's plans, uh, it's going to change our economy dramatically. Many people are, are going to gain. Many people are going to lose. If we today spent these to be fair, tens of trillions of dollars that I think many members of the administration would like to spend and make the United States of America carbon neutral. And nobody else ha has our, our aggressive, adopts our aggressive approach. And they only make modest gains in CO2 emissions. How much is going to lower the world temperature and how much is of it, how, how much, how much uh, are we going to reduce carbon emissions? Now, if our audience wants to fully understand Washington, D.C., listen to the answer to this very basic and important question. Because the rule number one in Washington for politicians is, if you don't like the question, answer another question. So she totally dodges this question by not answering it, but providing a different answer to a different question. Um, I want to say that the administration has a really firm commitment to communities to be able to take advantage of the economic opportunity. Now, I want our audience to understand and hear the brilliance of Senator John Kennedy in his folksy manner of diving in to the question of cost and benefit and how this is going to change America and whether it is really worth it. Now, listen to his question. We both know this is going to cause major displacement. Let's don't kid each other. You're not going to turn coal miners into coders overnight. You're not going to turn fossil fuel workers in, into solar experts overnight. And, and there are not as many solar jobs as there are oil and gas. So I don't want to get off into that. These are important questions. Uh, if, if we, if we uh, become carbon neutral and we don't get cooperation from China and India, what have we, what have we accomplished? Well, let me jump in here because the answer to this question is so fundamental on whether or not we should spend as a country tens of trillions of dollars, in addition to all the money we've been talking about with bills that are currently before Congress. The administration would like to spend tens of trillions of dollars more on a Green New Deal 
to get us carbon neutral. So I want to break here and go to commercial and come back. And the audience then can hear the silliness of the response to this most fundamental and important question. So let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. Welcome back to the final segment of America's Web Radio. And this is Ron Bachman. We are talking about the health of the country by exposing many of the interactions that occur in Washington, D.C. that most of us don't get a chance to hear. It doesn't show up on the national news, doesn't show up on C-SPAN in all likelihood, but they are videoed. And I want to follow up now on the last segment where we're listening to Senator John Kennedy kind of delve down into the most critical issues on our energy policy and the Green New Deal. He's already established that to create a carbon neutral country, we are talking about tens of trillions of dollars at a minimum, maybe a hundreds of trillions of dollars with Energy Secretary uh, Granholm. So let's go back to that question he's asking now. If we spend this money, but nobody else in the world does, what have we really gained? So let me back up and be sure we all have that question in mind, and then we'll talk about uh, the answer that is so ridiculous from administration that hasn't been able to work with uh, partners around the world, has turned off our allies, has said they are going to negotiate with the Taliban appropriately to get our people out, and obviously they have no ability uh, to negotiate anything. But let's listen to the question and then the answer from our energy secretary. Uh, if, if we, if we uh, become carbon neutral and we don't get cooperation from China and India, what have we, do, what have we accomplished? The goal is to get cooperation from China. And I know, but what if they don't? Well, what, what if we go spend these t- tens of trillions of dollars and President Xi Jinping, the people of China are wonderful people, by the way, uh, President Xi lies like he breathes. We know that. The Communist Party, they're gangsters. What, what if they, what, I mean, they've probably built a coal power, coal powered power plant while we, you and I have been talking. What have we achieved? Now, audience out there, listen to the innocence with a lack of understanding of the world and reality of our enemies out there who have no interest in doing what we're talking about. They're not woke like we are. They're not spending money or proposing to spend money or thinking about spending money on craziness. But listen to what our Secretary of Energy thinks that she's going to be able to do if we go ahead and commit tens of trillions, again, maybe hundreds of trillions of dollars to help the world get carbon neutral, let alone whether that has any real impact on humanity or not. But listen to the answer that is so, just lacks any reality. The administration has a strategy to make sure that all of our, all of the people who have signed on to this Paris Agreement meet the goals that they have articulated. And that means working with allies. Now, audience, I want you to listen carefully to the next exchange between Senator John Kennedy and uh, uh, Grantholm. Here is classic John Kennedy making a point in a very folksy way, but challenges the idea that the administration has goals or a strategy to do something, and there's nothing tangible about it, and the outcome is very unrealistic. Listen to this exchange. It is a great exchange from my perspective in listening to how you delve into something in a very direct and honest way. But I'm asking a very practical question. My son who I love dearly, has a strategy to have his dad buy him a 911 Targa Porsche. <laughs> it's not going to happen. And I'm raising a very legitimate question, I think. If we spend these trillions of dollars and we go through all this displacement and we don't get cooperation from China and India, what, what, what is the pain worth the gain? And how do we know? Okay, now you've heard the question, audience. Um, Anticipate the answer if you want, because it happens over and over again. I want you to understand how career bureaucrats and career politicians, and Grantholm is a career politician. She was governor of Michigan and ran it into the ground. 
before she left, became a commentator on CNN. They will set up classically a straw man. They will say, well, here's what will, terrible things will happen if we don't do this. But they have no clue as to what's going to happen. And so they use that to justify the unrealistic um, programs that they're proposing that they know. They've got to know in their heart. They can't be that stupid. But this is the way liberals argue. This is the way bureaucrats argue. This is the way career politicians argue. So just listen to the answer and know that if you listen to politicians in the future, you'll hear the same kind of diversion from realistic questions. They'll answer different questions if they don't like the question being asked. They'll blame somebody else for it. They'll say that if we don't do this, then something terrible is going to happen, setting up this straw man kind of a um, option, which is unrealistic. So just listen to uh, uh, the energy secretary kind of dodge the reality of what's being asked. I would say um, we have a strategy to get those countries on board. And if we don't pursue this strategy, what then? Then you have climate disasters that are upon us. California is now could be on fire again this summer. And if we don't take action, then where are, where is, where are we with respect to the other disasters? So we have to uh, approach our allies. Okay, the senator now having gotten the bureaucratic classic dodges, not answering the question, setting up a false alternative, um, he's going to ask the most important question now that he's set this all up with the brilliance of uh, Senator John Kennedy. Um, listen to the final question and the kind of response again, a non-responsive, I don't know the answer to that kind of a question that should be known by the Secretary of Energy who's proposing to spend tens of trillions as a minimum that we don't have. Listen to John Kennedy's question. If we spend all the money that the Biden administration wants to spend, let's take in its current infrastructure bill uh, to reduce CO2 emissions, what percentage of the increase in carbon emissions worldwide, not the United States, um, is going to be reduced? Clearly, Senator Kennedy is not getting answers to his most important questions from the Secretary of Energy. She's just stalling, delaying, hemming and hawing laughing at the questions under her breath. So let's listen to the exchange now of frustration from Senator Kennedy to the uh, Secretary of Energy. Well, the, all of these countries have signed on. All I, of them have. No, I'm, I'm talking about, I know, and you're trusting them. But well, no, I, believe in, I believe in metrics. Yeah. Before, if you spend a lot of taxpayer dollars, you ought to know, first of all, what you expect to get and realistically assess whether you're going to get it. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. And the kind of presentation and questioning that you have with Secretary of Energy Grantholm um, really shows this audience the sausage making that goes on in Washington, not just in developing legislation, which is behind the scenes, but the lack of transparency, the um, Texas two-step around uh, answering questions that are very straightforward, the lack of knowledge on key questions, uh, not trying to get metrics on if we spend this, what's the return on this, uh, dodging the question, answering other questions. This is classic of what we see from most administrations, but especially this Biden administration, because I believe they have a hidden agenda, which to most of us following this is out front. We can see it, we can understand it, but for the American people, there is a sense of we don't want to tell them the truth because we know that they don't agree with our truth, so we will either not say it, we will avoid it, uh, we will do anything we can so that the American people really don't understand what we're doing until it's already done. It's kind of like the Nancy Pelosi comment. The way you'll find out what's in this legislation is after it passes, you can read it kind of a thing. Classic Washington, a terrible way to run a country. There's no reason for this kind of deception that goes on. So I'd like to share with this audience one final 
segment on John Kennedy and the brilliance that he brings to Washington, D.C. Here is a interchange between Senator Kennedy and a judicial nominee of the Biden administration. I present this not to change topics uh, to talk about now judicial nominees versus some of the policies we've been discussing over the last hour, but to show you the kind of deception and excuses people use who have radical ideas that feel an ability, a responsibility, I guess, to lie and to say, well, that was something I said a long time ago, or that was something that um, I said as a private citizen, but I won't act that way in the government position that you're, I've been nominated for. So just listen to this exchange with a Hampton Dellinger, who's up for um, a judicial nominee. I want to read you a tweet from 2019. This is what the tweet says. Yes, there are some women GOP peers, meaning members of the Republican Party, and a tiny number of Democrats who want government, not women, to control women's bodies. But if there were no Republican men in elected office, there would be no abortion bans. Do, do, do you think that my votes with respect to abortion are based on the fact that I want to control women? Now listen to this judicial nominee, Hampton Dillinger, hem and haw and sidestep the answer and make uh, excuses. Senator, I, I cannot speak to that. Well, why'd you say it in front of God and country? And Senator, you said every Republican, other than one, the ones that you like, have their position on abortion because they're misogynistic. Senator, I, I, do you believe in God? Uh, Senator, I, I have faith. I believe. Um, I, I certainly. Some, a lot of people have faith. Right. Did it ever occur to you that that some people may may uh, base their their position on abortion on their faith? Senator, I I sincerely appreciate. People have a different um, position on abortion than I. Sure, don't tweet it. Have you ever tweeted that? That, Senator, I recognize the difference between someone saying something, you know, inartfully uh, as a private citizen and working as a lawyer. Jeez, man, that's not just one tweet, Counselor. You got a a whole bunch of them here, along with King Kong's arm. Well, there you have it, audience. Uh, Real insight into the duplicity, the lying, the deception, the distortion of our government under this Biden administration. You cannot believe a word they say. They will not tell you the real truth. And sometimes it takes a down-home country lawyer like John Kennedy kind of bring it out and expose it. So join us next week, and we'll do some of the same things with other uh, nominees, other cabinet members in this Biden administration. So we look forward to seeing you next week.